Hey guys, we're looking at uh, Isaiah 1 today, and it starts off saying that this is a vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, so it kind of gives you his, his lineage, uh, and it says that it's occurring during the, um, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And you can go back to like the books of Chronicles, uh, First and Second Chronicles, and um, you know a couple other the Old Testament books to kind of see what was going on during this time frame. There's other Old Testament books that talk about this time frame as well. Uh, the point being is is that this was a vision that Isaiah saw um, about the children of Israel and and Judah uh, during that time frame. Or, so one of the things that we're going to see here is that he says in verse 4 that this is, or actually let's go back to verse 2, he's, and the Lord is speaking and he says, I have nourished up and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. So one of the things that we kind of see here about the children of Israel is that they kind of had a tendency to be blessed and then once they got to this point of, of blessing, their eyes came off of God and on the blessing and then they would fall. Uh, and then they would sit in this kind of uh, this period of despair for a while while they learned to reseek God and then they would start seeking God again and then God would start blessing them again and then it was just this constant up and down fall and the purpose of this and the intent of this is to teach us that this is something that uh, that occurs in our lives as well as we have a tendency to get our eyes off of God and to start to just seek the blessing to just seek whatever objective it is, whether it be uh, you know financial status, whether it be success in business, whether it be um, you know healthy marriage, whatever. All of these things are not in and of themselves necessarily wrong, but if they're not done God's way, they can be because then it's a way of us seeking the goal without seeking the one that is actually giving. Um, giving us that success it's a way of seeking the the gift versus the giver and we have to understand that the gift is is a byproduct of seeking the giver uh, when we seek the gift itself without seeking the giver uh, we're essentially saying you know we're taking that kind of spoiled mentality you know it's that little kid that that doesn't care about coming over and giving his mom and dad a hug he just wants to treat um, and we look at that and, and say you know that's that's not a good thing and that's not that's not something that that God wants for us is, you know either so when we get here we see that you know God has done this he says I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me and then he goes on in verse 4 and it says all sinful nation a people laden with iniquity a seed of evildoers children that are corruptors that are forsaken the Lord they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto angle, anger, and they have gone away backwards. So one of the things that we see here is as, as they were kind of coming out of Egypt and everything else, God has blessed them up to a point, and now they're well, and now they're going, they're going backwards. Uh, they're seeking that gift versus the giver, and we'll see this as, as we go on as well. But one of the things that I do want to kind of see here is that even in the midst of all this, even in the midst of all this kind of falling away, people seeking the gift instead of the giver, we do see that the Lord preserves a remnant within that community. And we see this in verse 9 where he says, Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and should have been like unto Gomorrah. So God preserves a remnant within within this particular community and and one of the things that we see here is that if God had not had left some sort of godly influential force that the entire community would have just devolved into uh, into the same type of debauchery and sinfulness as Sodom and Gomorrah and we see this in verse 10 where he says hear the word of the Lord ye rulers of Sodom uh, give ear unto the law of God ye people of Gomorrah and he's talking about he's he's basically calling the Israelites look you guys are Sodom and you guys are Gomorrah I mean and he's he's trying to clue them in on the fact that look you guys you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah you saw what happened when when that level of sinfulness had basically just permeated every aspect of the culture um, without that preserving influence of God without him preserving that remnant this is exactly what had what would have occurred and he's telling them to you know get yourself refocused 
So one of the things that we see here is that in verse 11, he says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or, or of he goats. And one of the things that we can kind of see here is that despite all of this sinfulness, despite all the debauchery that's going on here, these people are still, they're still pursuing these religious means. They're still doing all their sacrifices. You know, we'll see, you know, further on here, they're still doing uh, feast days. They're still basically keeping the law, but they're keeping the law in, in, in an external sense. They're, they're going through the motions, but that's not the intent of the law. The intent of the law is not to get you to not commit adultery. The intent of the law is to get you to not want to not commit adultery. It's, it's for you to want God more than you want whatever that fleshly desire is. And what we're seeing here is that people, once again, as we have a tendency to seek the gift and not the giver, we also have a tendency to be religious but in an empty sense that doesn't that doesn't really focus on God. It, it's not about getting close to God. It's not about getting our hearts um, right with God. It's about just basically going through some sort of religious steps or whatever so we can check that box and basically say that we're good. Uh, it's a self-righteous approach to uh, to our religion with God and um, and that's that's something that Jesus was never a fan of and we can see that even in the Old Testament here God is not a fan of at all. Um, and he tells him in verse 13, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbath, the calling of the assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. So he tells him, all of your feast days, all of your uh, sacrifices, everything that you're doing, all the religiosity that you were told to do, and that you're doing because your heart is not right with me, I, I don't care anything about it. Don't even do it. I don't even want you to do it. And he tells him that it, it basically makes him sick. But then he goes on in verse 16, and there's that voice from God that is still trying to draw his people back. And he says, Wash you, make you clean, put away evil of your doings. From before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And that even in the midst of all of this debauchery, even in the midst of these basically, of the only reason that these people have not just fallen rock bottom and, and gone to this level of, uh, of sinfulness as Sodom and Gomorrah is because of God's influence. Even with everything that's going on, God is still calling them in verse 16 and 17 to repentance. And he's saying, wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Stop it. Stop all the religiosity. Stop all the things that you're doing. Come back to me, and and I'll fix it. And he tells them in, in verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though, shall, though they shall be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So God is telling them, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Come to a place of repentance. Come back to me. Come back to me with your heart, not with your actions. Not in the sense that an action without your heart. I want your heart, and then the actions will basically come on naturally as a byproduct of that. God wants to be first in our life here, and that we can see that when a nation does this, um, they fall to great depths. And we can see that, um, that we can look at this both uh, on a national level, in, in context to our country, our own country, but we can also look at this in context to um, maybe a church or, or even us as individuals. Um, if we're not placing God first, if God does not have our whole heart, He doesn't care anything about whether or not you show up to church on Sunday. He doesn't care anything about your tithes. He doesn't care anything about your offering. God wants our heart. If He doesn't have that, then He doesn't have us. And that's, that's what God wants. God wants us. So... Anyway, I want to share that with you guys today. So, God bless.